All right, welcome back to The Fix, live in the Prop Swap Studios. I'm your host, Ryan Rothstein, taking you up to 1 a.m., already a Wednesday. Uh, and it's about that time. Every night right here on The Fix, we talk to NFL Eagles insider John McMullen. Follow John on Twitter at jfmcmullen, phillyvoice.com, Sports Illustrated at si.com, and host of Extending the Play right here on AM 1490 every Saturday morning from 10 a.m., to 11 a.m. All right, John, here we go. Um, what should we get into tonight? I, I just feel like our conversations are, it's the same old song and dance talking Jalen Hurts and Carson Wentz. What can we do differently tonight? Well, I, I did like Jason Kelsey today. I don't know if you saw, but he, he, he put the lose on purpose crowd on blast, basically. Uh, and <laughs> he, really, he really put them in their place. And I kind of enjoyed that. I must say, it was. If you consider what has gone on in Philadelphia over the years, and I, you know, uh, it, it seems to have bled, bled into other sports. And people are constantly saying, "Man, if you can't win, the, if you can't win the Super Bowl, you know, if something goes wrong, lose on purpose. Lose on purpose." And Jason Kelsey put those people on blast. What did um, what did he say exactly? Just paraphrasing it, of course. How did it come up? Um, so any more details? Well, as somebody asked uh, Jason about the young offensive linemen, uh, about you know their playing necessity, and uh, it just kind of extrapolated into evaluation versus trying to win games and. You know, he he explained it uh, very succinctly. And remember, you're talking about a guy who's 33 years old, and if you remember, hyperextended his elbow, probably shouldn't be playing. Uh, but he's out there playing um, for his teammates, uh, even though there were three eight and one now four eight and one. Uh, and and he just kind of said, look, these people don't understand that there there is a culture to this. And if you signal to your players, if you're a general manager um, and you're an executive and you signal to your players that you're not trying to win, you know, that that message is going to be loud and received. And you're going to create that kind of culture where people just give up. And in turn, you're not going to create the culture where when things go right, there is uh, a possibility you go a long way and maybe even win a Super Bowl. Uh, and, and basically that's what he was trying to express. That was what he was trying um, to get across and, you know, basically said everything in the NFL is about winning that week, whether you're 2-10, and 10-2, ten, ten Super Bowl contender, top five draft choice. Everything's got to be about winning. And I, I really don't think this generation of fans understands that. And that's the way athletes have been forever. And, uh, you know, Brian, I, I, it, it really comes up with running backs. You always hear it all the time when you have great running backs. And Ezekiel Elliott's a perfect example in Dallas. who seems a little bit washed, to be honest, uh, best days behind him and if you think about all the touches he had early in his career and people are saying you're wasting Ezekiel Elliott what are you going to do you're going to put him in a a chamber until you're ready I I mean that's that's not how it works and I, I really don't think people understand that yeah I mean I guess we have to blame Sam Hinkie right well, I don't say that name. You know that. Uh, I, I, no, because tanking had, and that's another thing. That's an interesting thing because I don't know. In Philadelphia, they think they invented tanking. It had been around a long time before that. Um, they just took it to a, another degree. And you know, you've heard me have arguments on other platforms all the time. I, I, I just. I will never understand why they think this is innovative or they think no one has ever thought about this before. 
Like, it's not difficult. People understand. And it is easier in basketball. Jason even mentioned that. But I, I, I always go back to the NBA, and every once in a while, yes, you can get one player that puts you over the top. But then people act like LeBron James comes around every year. Well, since LeBron James came around, and what year is he in now? I don't even know. 17? What are we at? He's in his 18th. Um, 18th year. Have you seen another LeBron James over that 18 years? Because I haven't. No, not even close. Once in a generation means once in a generation. It doesn't mean once every year, once every two years. It doesn't mean really good. It means generational. LeBron is everybody else you want to name. Look, there's great players, but they ain't that guy. Yeah, there's a lot of great players, but it it depends how you define great and how you want to – like, there's not many players that change a franchise. Like, Devin Booker is a young, up-and-coming superstar. Great player. Yeah, Great but player. he didn't. He hasn't he's changed not the Suns. Win you, he's not going to win you a championship, right? You you have to build a team. Everybody, name any player you want to name except LeBron James. Giannis, as great as he is, Giannis, he's not winning you a title. Nope. By himself. Not huh? even close, Joel yeah. Embiid. Not even close. Ben Simmons, who gets compared not. to LeBron, and that's a whole nother conversation. But style of play, fine, I'll accept it. But he's not even close. He can't take this team to the, to that level no. by himself. So, and, and and that's what Jason was saying. And he said, "This isn't the NBA." But even in the NBA, yes, Michael Jordan comes around once in a generation, and he can go win you a championship. LeBron James can go win you a championship. Everybody else, you got to build a team. It's helpful. It'll be helpful for the New York Jets to get Trevor Lawrence. Make no mistake about that. But that's not going to win them a championship unless they make a lot of good decisions. All right, so let's get to some injury updates. Uh, Jack Driscoll been playing very well he's going to miss the rest of the season with that knee injury uh that was reported yesterday and then there's been you know Rodney McLeod we talked about he's out for the season with the torn ACL that's a huge blow but the Eagles did get some guys back uh today so why don't you run through all of that well I I would say you mentioned Jack Crystal I think he had his his best game and I think it was uh a really um uh, I you know amazing kind of performance because he got hurt. He sprained his MCL early uh, against the Saints. He essentially played three quarters uh, on something that's you know probably an eight week injury. So you know if this happened week one or week two, it wouldn't be uh, a season ending injury. But because of the timing, because of the calendar, um, he's essentially going to be shut down. Uh, for the rest of the season, um, and and you know we're going to go into week fourteen and <laughs> number thirteen. And Jason also talked about that today. Thirteen different uh, offensive line groups in fourteen games, which is pretty amazing. So that's uh, that's an issue. And then you mentioned the secondary. I, obviously, we already knew Rodney McLeod out for the season, uh, which is very, very difficult. He was having a, a very good season. Um, and, and and then you talk about Avante Maddox. He's not going to be able to play. Uh, Darius Slay still in the concussion protocol. Um, and we mentioned that earlier in the week. That's going to be something to watch to see if he can get back in time. Because, boy, man, if, if you don't have Slay and Maddox, I mean, the Eagles just don't have corner, corners to roll out there. Um, and, you know, it's another one of those I'll never understand. You know, Jim Schwartz has done an amazing job, not just this year, but years past. They've had so many injuries at the cornerback position. It seems to happen every year. And he seems to cobble things together all the time. He's going to have to do it again. And, 
that's one of those where I, I don't understand the people that want that guy fired. I really don't. John, I asked you towards the end of our conversation last night about Jake Elliott and how he's fallen and how inconsistent he's become. Just a couple years ago, he was this young up-and-coming kicker who the Eagles relied on heavily and arguably a big part of the reason why the Eagles won the Super Bowl. You have an article up on SI.com talking about just that, and I know Elliot spoke to uh, you guys, a.k.a. the media, earlier today. Yeah, and it was, uh, you know, I, I I think it was good for Jake to do that. He didn't have to do that. Obviously, he's struggling so much in, in this kind of Zoom world. You can get away with it. You can just say, no, I don't want to deal with that. Uh, but to his credit, um, he stood up and took all the questions. He certainly has been struggling. I mean, 22-yard field goal, oof, uh, missed a 27-yarder uh, earlier this season against the Giants, a couple extra points, which are obviously 33-yarders now. Uh, he's always had that, though. He's kind of always had that one or two missed extra points a season. But, you know, the thing is, he got that big contract, big for a kicker at least, uh, and that was really a demarcation line. He was great before it. He was the fourth uh, best kicker all time as far as field goal accuracy before he signed that extension. And since he signed that extension, he's been he's been bad, basically 70%, uh, which is – Disastrous. The league average is about 83, 84 uh, percent on field goals. So, I mean, that is not good. And, and I kind of mentioned, I think, yesterday that if he didn't make a lot of money for a kicker and this team wasn't, we always talk about that with the quarterbacks, uh, how this team is in salary cap disarray because of a number of issues, including COVID-19, uh, for next season. If he had a normal contract, if he was still on his rookie contract, I got to be honest, he'd probably be out of here. Two things have saved him that money because if the Eagles cut him, they'll basically five and a half million dollars of dead money next season. And people, by the way, I'll throw and people still think the Eagles are going to take thirty-four million of dead money in Carson Wentz. It's just absurd. Uh, they're not even going to take five and a half for a kicker. Um, whereas if they keep Jake, it's a it's just over three million as a cap hit, uh, and that's why he still has a job. That and the fact that it's really difficult in in today's environment. The league ramped up the COVID protocols, obviously, a number of weeks ago. So basically, if you say, okay, we want a new kicker, well, it takes you five days to get him in the building. So you essentially have to make that decision on a Monday. Um, By the time he passes all the protocols, you might be ready by Saturday, and you got no practice and you're going to put him out there on Sunday? And then what if he fails? So a lot of these struggling kickers around the league, that's that's the reason they're keeping their job, to be honest. I just want to switch gears, and this is a big turn here. Um, But Matthew Stafford, and there's a lot of rumors, so why don't you educate me or or fill me in on how much you know, if if anything, regarding this, anything extra. Uh, His house has sold. His wife has been very vocal about wanting to leave the area. He missed practice today. Uh, There's a lot of rumors that he wants to go play for Elway in Denver. Uh, What can you you tell us about Matthew Stafford and and the Detroit Lions? Well, I, I can tell you, you know, uh, we've, uh, we've mentioned all the way back to training camp, his wife is very, very upset. And and when you have uh, those kind of family issues, you can imagine the kind of pressure uh, it puts on um, uh, you uh, as a player, as a person. And, yeah, I do think uh, that family wants out of Detroit. Um, they were completely disrespected really twice um, back in training camp for a false positive. And you remember when uh, people were basically heckling uh, Kelly Stafford. And, and 
you know, we, we talk about how difficult fans are in Philadelphia, and they are. And they really are. Um, but, you know, it happens in other cities as well. And you're, you're, I don't know if anyone knows the health issues that she's had, but, you know, and then to go heckler at Costco or wherever the heck it was, uh, because you think a false positive is not is is a positive, and even if they were positive, why are you heckling someone's wife and kids at a grocery store? So I, I mean, I think that was the start of it, and that obviously soured. And and then Michigan as a whole has been one of those states that has been very, very strict with lockdowns and things of that nature. A lot of hypocrisy from the governor um, allowing her husband to do things that regular uh, people cannot do. Uh, and she kind of spoke up on that and pointed out that hypocrisy and got killed for that by a group of people. So, yeah, I, I, I don't... And then we don't need that's before you even get to football reasons and you know that's a mess of an organization and obviously uh, fire the coach fire the general manager and now we'll see how they they go forward uh, Lewis Riddick I know is getting an interview to be the GM there but yeah I think that family wants out of Detroit I don't think there's any question about that I was going to um, ask you about Lewis Riddick. He's interviewing um, for the Lions, like you mentioned. I also heard the Houston Texans, and his name has been brought up, of course, by fans for the Philadelphia Eagles. And it doesn't seem like Jeffrey Lurie's going to make any moves with Howie, but is there a Daryl Morey situation, any any chances of that, where he gives the keys to Lewis Riddick, Howie Roseman remains in his role, um, or that's just completely ridiculous and off the table? Uh, completely ridiculous and off the table. Uh, I, you know, Lewis used to work here, and the reason he doesn't work here anymore is because of Howie Roseman. Uh, that was one of those power uh, struggles that Howie won. He he wins. Uh, you know, he's one of the greatest fighters of all time. He's lost one, uh, and he's he's got a lot of pelts on the wall. One of them is Lewis Riddick, and it, it's. By some, look, Jeffrey Lurie was very close to Joe Banner as well, and he ultimately moved on from Joe Banner. So at some point it's possible, it is possible, that he can move on from Howie Roseman down the road. I'm not going to say that's an impossibility. I think he understands, and Jeffrey, I'm talking about Jeffrey at this point, everybody's got a shelf life and understands that, yes, at some point, He's probably going to have to make a move, but he's certainly not going to embarrass Howie Roseman by hiring somebody like that who he doesn't have a good personal relationship with. So you'd sort of be slapping him on, on two occasions. And even if, if Jeffrey Lurie did uh, decide to move on from Howie Roseman, it will not be because he doesn't like him on a personal level. So I don't think he would ever in a million years do that to him, uh, to hire somebody who, again, they've had some issues in the past. Yeah, he's just been a name that, and it's amazing what the ESPN job can do for these guys. Look at John Gruden. I mean, you can point to a million different examples. I, like, I, I enjoy listening to Lewis Riddick. Um, I don't really remember too much of him as an executive, and now he's in front of us every day if you just follow the national football scene in any capacity. How how good is he? Like, how good of a GM could he potentially be? Well, I, I don't think anybody knows that because he hasn't done the job before. But I, I do think, yeah, you become more high profile in that type of situation. I, I will say he's got more of a personnel background than guys who have gone that route in the past. Um, you go John Lynch, for instance, who's hired out of TV, even if you go all the way back to Matt Millen. I, I mean, he, he was a personnel guy before he got into TV and sort of continued in that route 
uh, not quite as much. Somebody like Daniel Jeremiah, another somebody who worked with the Eagles in the past, um, as a lower level scout, but and and stayed in the personnel aspect of it when it comes to TV. And Lewis kept his foot in from that standpoint. But yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's not the traditional way. Uh, you typically uh, become a GM. Uh, typically, you know, you're you, you you do it like Joe Douglas did it uh, when he got the Jets job and he was here and, and he was second in charge. And even Andrew Barry, if you think about his his career, I mean, that's typically how it's done. However, there have been those TV guys in the past, and people do get enamored uh, when you're on TV all the time. And, you know, John Lynch has been relatively successful. Um, Obviously, the 49ers have taken a big step back, but uh, Matt Millen, not so much. Uh, Mike Mayock's another really essentially TV guy, but uh, obviously from the draft perspective, he was always deep into the personnel. Uh, So it's not as rare as it once was. Talking with our NFL Eagles insider, John McMullen. Follow John on Twitter at JF McMullen, host of Extending the Play every Saturday right here on 1490, 10 a.m. to 11. Phillyvoice.com and SI.com is where you can find all of John's written work. All right, John, uh, that wraps up another segment for the football fix here on The Fix. The Eagles right now getting six to six and a half uh, on your way out. Answer this. Do you like the Eagles to at least cover that number at the moment? Uh, I do not at the moment because of all the injuries in the secondary, and we'll see how that shakes out. If Slay can get out there, maybe I'll, I'll change my tune a little bit. Still early in the week. All right, and we'll get more into that. Um, certainly Friday, previewing the the game on Sunday and, and more tomorrow night before we wrap up the week. All right, John, appreciate it, my friend. All right, thanks, Ryan. Yep, there he is, Johnny Mack, joining us for his nightly appearance right here on The Fix. All right, we got to get to break. Uh, to start off the second hour, we have Jeff Parles, sports betting insider, executive producer of content for Book It HQ, host of the Parlay Cast. He's formerly with the VEASAN Network, um, so he'll bring a lot of insight and entertainment for us on the other side when we come back.